All right, we can get started. Um, today, I have like four or five slides left from the last lecture. I just want to finish off where we left, and then I will jump into this lecture, which is mostly about demand theory, math and graphing, less good stories and anecdotes, and more just a little bit of like the basic elements of demand theory, uh, budget constraints, indifference curves, how to get demand curves out of that. Uh, going back to lecture three, we're talking about different types of market failures to sort of motivate environmental economics, how we got into the class. Um, and I was talking about Hetch Hetchy Valley. There's pictures on the top, the before and after, uh, and this dramatic romanticized painting of the before uh, and the after with the dam that supplies San Francisco with electricity and drinking water. And this is just a classic question of the people who made the decision to do this over 100 years ago, uh, having different time preferences for wilderness and unspoiled amazing places than we do now. And so some people in San Francisco are trying to get this on the ballot to um, talk about removing this dam and restoring this valley. And so that's uh, you know, a classic example of preferences for the environment being different uh, in different time periods, uh, a market failure of communication between the two time periods. Uh, another big one that we're facing with and we'll talk through about throughout the class is facing the issue of global uh, carbon emissions. So if we think about how disruptive climate change and carbon emissions are going to be to future generations, we can do calculations in billions and billions or trillions of dollars of income that will be lost or disrupted, um, income that will not be gained. Uh, you know, the carrying capacity of the planet in terms of the number of human beings will be different than the carrying capacity that we're headed towards now. Um, if we were to internalize that, we would change our behaviors now. We would change much quicker our, uh, the way we consume, the way we produce. Uh, so we can uh, do financial and economic models of uh, how carbon emissions are going to change our economy, but we can't seem to be able to change our behavior now. So we're sort of all implicitly involved in this market failure right now. Uh, another uh, area that's pointed out in the book is there's areas where government makes decisions uh, that favor one group over the other, or favor a group, you know, favor dams for farmers instead of dams for wildlife. Uh, the Hetch Hetchy would be a case of this in another way as well. Um, there's different groups that can influence Congress in different ways for specific earmarks. Uh, we talked before about the Defense Department influencing Congress to spend billions of dollars on national defense, but that's favoring those producers. Um, so, and uh, this week, the Farm Bill finally passed after many, many years. But uh, this, this slide is sort of pointing out on a colossal scale the pollution that we get from overproduction of basic grains. Uh, this, this picture here is a map of the United States with all of the areas that drain into the Mississippi River. That is our grain belt. That's where the majority of Corn and soybeans, the two biggest crops in the country, are raised. And uh, there's too much fertilizer applied, too much phosphates applied. They, those run down the Mississippi River in drainage. And we have a huge dead zone where the Mississippi River comes out into the Gulf of Mexico where nothing is alive because of excess fertilizer coming out of the Mississippi River. So on the one hand, we have this government policy favoring ethanol, causing this huge increase in corn production with higher corn prices. On the other hand, we have uh, a huge environmental disaster for the uh, near shore fisheries, uh, which are people's livelihoods in Louisiana, where nothing's growing due to the, due to the pollution from agriculture. So we have you know, government policy favoring farmers uh, with this inadvertent effect of decreasing a fishery. So, uh, so indirect environmental effects all over the place. Uh, the Farm Bill is sort of an interesting story. I don't know if any of you followed it this week. Uh, it's been a huge part of our federal budget for a long time. And as we talked before, we subsidized the production of basic grains uh, as like a fundamental part of our rural economy. Uh, the way that it used to work was it joined together a welfare program for rural farmers with a welfare program for the urban poor. So the welfare program for farmers was the subsidy and target and uh, you know, deficiency payments for grains. And food stamps was uh, the transfer for the urban poor. And it used to be that it was, it was, it was sort of well cooked together in Congress that always had very broad bipartisan support. And the, it was one of those things that made it through Congress very smoothly every five years. But uh, this time, the House of Representatives has decided to uh, separate out food stamps from payments to farmers and consider them separately. And they, specifically, this Congress was looking to reduce the amount that's spent on food stamps by several billion dollars. And they hammered out an agreement. They finally got it through this week. But the, it's a farm bill that's pretty, um, more, a lot more contentious than previous farm bills. Uh, another interesting story that we have in California uh, is a chemical called MTBE, sort of a precursor to ethanol. Uh, the Clean Air Act, EPA mandated that a certain amount of this chemical I can't remember what the chemical name is, uh, methyl something or other, um, be formulated into gasoline to make gasoline engines uh, burn more cleanly. So increasing the octane through using this other chemical that, that was like a byproduct at refineries. So they were requiring this chemical to be added to gasoline. It later turned out that many gasoline tanks at many uh, stations, uh, fuel stations throughout cities all over the country, but it's a big problem in California, they all leak. But gasoline, when it leaks, degrades rather quickly. And this thing that was being blended into gasoline was not degrading. It was very persistent and it would stay in the soil and it would migrate through the soil and it would get into the groundwater. So this is, a, this is a, like one of those interesting side effects of a regulation that was meant to make the air cleaner. It was meant to decrease air pollution. But it ended up uh, causing big problems with groundwater contamination. Uh, so then now this is being phased out, but there's huge programs where you have to dig up the tanks and mediate the soil, and they had to figure out what sort of microbes. This is like a very persistent uh, chemical that's not degraded by naturally occurring microbes. What ways can they do remediation? So it's turning out to be very costly as well. It's like a, a byproduct of this. There's a whole remediation of the MTP, the whole industry around this now. So another big market failure that we're facing, certainly with the climate change issue, uh, is pollution between countries. In the United States, most of what we'll talk about in the class are regulations within the United States at the federal level and then implementation at state level. Uh, but there's an estimate uh, that there are 18 billion kilograms of air pollution that leave East Asia for the Pacific and 4.5 billion kilograms of air pollution arrive at North America. So there's a huge transfer of pollution right now that we moved a lot of industrial production out of North America and we source everything in Asia that we're getting that pollution back from Asia. This is a, this is a you know, particulate matter, not just uh, carbon emissions. And obviously, we've had a lot of difficulty between countries re reaching any sort of accord for international concerted action on carbon emissions. Uh, there was just another round of Kyoto a couple months ago, very contentious on what should be financial reparations to other countries. Uh, so we cannot force any countries to join, the United States being the most glaring example of a country that hasn't joined the process. Uh, and we can't force any other country to enforce a regulation. So countries can set up plans, how they're going to meet Kyoto, Kyoto Protocol commitments, but it's up to every individual country to do it. So it's very hard to figure out how to solve a global problem when there's so many different actors um, with different abilities to, to mandate uh, reductions in carbon to their industries. 
So summing this up, there's a whole list of different examples, different types of market failures. We have many different types of market failures. We start in Econ 1 with these assumptions about perfect markets, but the environmental economic side is we're looking at these different market failures. And where these come together, we're using the tools of economics to think about how we can get to efficient outcomes, outcomes that are going to take the least amount of resources, but make people the, uh, the best off. You know, there's different ways to solve problems that would cause more disruptions in the economy or cause more disruptions in the well-being of consumers and producers. But we want to use the tools of economics to guide us. Uh, we think that prices have a lot of information in them. So we want to use price information as a way to guide efficient regulation. All right, moving forward, now we're in chapter four. We're going to do budget constraints and indifference curves. Uh, we'll have some definitions that we're going to work through today. We're going to simplify the world down extremely into being a choice about two goods. Uh, we're going to say there's bundles of those two goods that are choice sets that are combinations of those two goods. Two quantities, a quantity of good one and a quantity of good two is a bundle. The budget constraint is how much we can afford, you know, what bundle, bundles we can afford of those two goods. The budget constraint is going to be defined by the amount of income and the price ratio of the two goods. The budget constraint is also actually a set of all of the different bundles that we could consume, that we could afford to consume. And then separate from the budget constraint, we have the indifference curve. An indifference curve I'll, I'll explain uh, extensively, but an indifference curve is a mapping of sets of bundles along which a consumer is indifferent between different bundles. So a mapping of combinations of the two goods at which the consumer is indifferent between those different points. Um, and that will look like a curve when we draw it out. Uh, finally, we're going to do all this through thinking about ordinal utility. Remember, utility was the well-being of the consumer. When you consume goods, you increase your utility. And uh, the terms here are ordinal and cardinal. Cardinal is like we have an actual numerical ranking of people's utility. Ordinal ranking is we just have the order. We just know what's better. Um, so we could rank bundles. I'd rather have this bundle than that bundle. I'd rather be on a higher indifference curve with these other set of bundles than a lower indifference curve with a lower set of bundles. As we get onto a higher indifference curve, we're going up in order to another higher level of utility. So this is assumptions about consumers being able to rank preferences. Um, so let's just really quickly go over what these, we're making a whole bunch of assumptions here. We're making everything abstracted into a two dimension because we want to graph things. That's how we motivate it. So graphing is only in two dimensions. The world has infinite possible choices. The amount of things you can spend your money on is overwhelmingly infinite. We're going to reduce that just down into two. We're going to make a bundle that's just got those two choices in it. And what I like to think about when we think about that is you have a three dimensional world. All the time we flatten that down into a two dimensional map. So that's going from three into two. So we have to think of, we have n choices or infinity choices. And we're going to, we're going to abstract that down into two dimensions. Uh, here's a picture of a topographic map. I hope you're all familiar with topographic maps. Here's Berkeley. We're right here. Uh, here's this biking map of different rides you can do in Tilden Park. Uh, have anybody heard of Strava? It's really popular right now on the bikers. So you can go biking around and uh, it makes little segments. So if you're going up Spruce to Grizzly Peak, it'll call that a segment. And then when you ride that, you can be king of the mountain or queen of the mountain. It'll, it'll say how fast you are going up or down Spruce. So people get really competitive and they get really into it because they see where they are on the leaderboard or you can compete with yourself. A lot of the fitness apps are like compete with your social network, compete with yourself. Strava's really taken on. And uh, I put this article up. I don't know if you see the headline up there, but there's a guy who uh, died in Tilden Park. There was not only going up, there was uh, segments going down. So he was racing down to be the fastest guy to go down. Does people know Tilden Park? There's that one road in the middle that they close for the newts in the winter. It goes from the steam trains down to the Botanical Garden. And uh, he was racing down that road. And some, the day before, somebody had taken away his king of the mountain on that descent. So he went back up there to try and get back on the top of the leaderboard and uh, hit somebody. And uh, the family sued the company, sued the people who make the app, saying they like, led him to his death. So uh, just a very strange world that we live in. Um, I like maps a lot. I like topographic maps. So I'll show you more maps. But... All right, so we have bundles. We're going to go back into the world of coffee and donuts. Our bundle is the quantities of the goods that we're going to consume. Some quantities can be zero. This is a little vector that's got two cups of coffee and three donuts. So it's, it's a bundle of two comma three. So if we had n possible choices, we walk in the cafe, there's an actually a huge number of things we can order in the cafe. Here's a big vector, but we're still going to get two cups of coffee and three donuts. So it's got a whole big sparse matrix there with a lot of zeros. Still our vector two and three. All right, so once again, motivating this, we have an economy with two goods. We want to draw pictures. We can only have two goods in the picture. Uh, we're going to have quantity of cups of coffee and the price of cup, the cup of coffee. So we're going to have uh, four, five things we're working with here. Quantity of cups of coffee, the price of the cup of coffee, the quantity of donuts, the price of donuts, and income. So there's five things that we're working with to draw our graph. Uh, we have a budget constraint. So first we'll just go through budget constraint. We have the, uh, a map of the bundles that we can afford. We have this income, and we're setting this as a definition of the price of the cup of coffee times the number of cups we buy, and the price of the donuts times the donuts that we buy. So this is a line that defines what we can buy. All of the different combinations of donuts and coffee that we can afford to buy. Any combination, set of combinations, any vector that lies above the line, we can't afford it. Any set of combination that's below the line, we could afford more than that. We would have change. <laughs> Uh, so the question is about change. For this case, we're just going to assume it, you, we're going to spend our income completely. Uh, in a more complicated world, you would have savings. You would have change back. Uh, you could have more than two goods. Then you would have coffee, donuts, and savings, or coffee, donuts, and change. Uh, in this case, you would have more than two time periods, coffee, donuts today, coffee, donuts tomorrow. So we usually think about savings are uh, consumption in another time period. But for today, we're going to assume that you spend all of that you have. All right, so what we want to do is graph this. And this time in our graph, it's not going to be price and quantity. We're going to do a quantity on each axis. And we're going to solve for one of the quantities to make a graph, preferably the one on the y-axis, because that's usually how we graph things. So we have the budget constraint. As I said, this is the amount of money in our pocket, the price of the coffee, the coffee, the price of the donuts, and the donuts. So let's solve this for coffee. And so this is just algebra here. This is minus the price of donuts over the price of coffee times the number of donuts. So I've just rewritten this algebraically, solving it. We're going to spend all our money on coffee or donuts. And if we think about graphing, we have two terms here. The first term, y over the price of coffee, is the intercept term. And the second term, which would be minus the price of donuts over the price of coffee, 
is the slope term. And then these are quantities, quantity good one, quantity good two. So now we have easily motivated how to graph these, intercept and slope. Um, it's uh, about points that are in the coffee and donut space that respond. And then there's, uh, there's two points that we have here, one, uh, each one, one with just coffee and one with just donuts. So this intercept here uh, is the just coffee point, uh, just coffee. We could also solve for this point, which would be the other place where it crossed the axis was the just donuts point. So we can solve for two points where the line crosses the axis, and because it's a straight line, that makes it a really easy way to draw the line. Uh, here's a general notation, so just mathematically, price one, a good one, we would say x1, price two, good x2. Uh, you don't have to write this down, it's going to be the same notation, but just saying, sometimes you'll see it generally expressed in, in some p1, x1 terms, graphing in x1 and x2 space. So we have a trade off. Obviously, economics is all about trade offs. If you have more coffee, you have to have less donuts. If you have more donuts, you have to have less coffee. And so the slope of the line is the ratio of the prices that's telling you how much you have to give up of one to get the other. The slope of the line is the price ratio expressing the trade off between one and the other. So we're going to start a graph, and instead of price and quantity, this would be quantity of coffee. And this is quantity of donuts. So they're both in quantities. Just raw quantities are the axes. And the slope of the line, we've said, is y over the price of coffee. And the intercepts, oh no, that is the intercept. The slope was the ratio of the prices. Sorry about that. The intercept was, um, so our slope would be set by the ratio between the two. We don't know the ratios, but whatever it is, the slope of the budget constraints would be set by the ratio of the two prices. And how far out this line is would be set by how much money we have in our pocket. Once we know the amount of money in our pocket, we can get the intercepts, and we'll know these two points. We'll know the slope. So once we know the amount of money that we have, amount of money in our pocket, uh, we can know exactly where this line is. If we just know the prices, we'll know the slope somewhere, wherever it is out there. If we have, you know, say, say this is our income in period one, if we go back the next day and we have more money, it would be further out, the budget constraint, if we had more money. All right, so let's do our example. Our income is $5. The price of coffee is $2 per cup of coffee. The price of the donut is $1 per donut. So if we, we can just look here and say, if we spent just on coffee, if we had $5, it was $2 per cup, we could have two and a half cups of coffee if we just bought coffee. If we just bought donuts, we could have five donuts. And the ratio of uh, the price of donuts over the price of coffee, so the slope was minus, uh, I'm getting messy here, minus price of donuts over price of coffee, so that's minus one half. Anyway, so if we go one, two, two and a half, so two and a half if we just buy coffee, 2.5 cups if we just bought coffee, one, two, three, four, five, so five donuts if we just bought donuts. We have a line that connects the two. The slope of that line is minus one half. This is a budget constraint. This is all of the different bundles we can afford. We can have different people with different preferences that would want just coffee or want just donuts or want different combinations of the two, but this line is a map in just coffee and donut space of what we could possibly afford. Um, <laughs> chunks, yeah, so, yeah. So, you know, chunks like this, something like that. Or that's half cup. So the world is a chunky world that we live in, I think you're pointing out, which is true. I'm assuming that it's continuously uh, changeable. The person can pour you a 0.2 cup of coffee here. Or let's say this is over the course of a year, and it's not just this one day purchase. You have a certain budget loaded onto your Cal One card. Over the course of a year, you're going to have 250 cups of coffee and 500 donuts. We like aggregate data better than single chunky data. Uh, or we could say all of the people going to the cafe have a certain income. Yeah, it's a chunky world for the individual consumer, but we're, uh, we're doing it in a continuous world for our math. Why don't I get rid of this little guy? Go away. All right, so, sorry, yeah, go ahead. Yeah? What's that? Yeah. That would be two. Uh, no, it's these two prices. So it's the price of donuts is one and the price of coffee is two. I think you're looking at the quantities here. So it's a little different. It's, you know, it gets inverted when you buy things with prices. Um, so here's some math for you. Got to work on at your seat really quick, five minutes with the person next to you, talk to somebody. Uh, three changes to the budget constraint. Okay. First one, income doubles. You have twice as much money in your pocket that day. Work through that. Does the slope change? Does the intercept change? Does the donut intercept change? Question two, increase in the price of coffee. Question three, increase in the price of donuts. So, uh, oop. sorry, I'm going to go back. All right, here's the three questions. So take five minutes. Try to draw these three changes with the person sitting next to you.